What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you could stand up and use your voice. Tonight, we're going to be taking a look at a random YouTube video that claims that atheism is worse than magic. Now, we're not talking about like Magic the Gathering or any other thing like that. What we're talking about is literal just poof pigeons and rabbits out of hats and shit. Uh, the video tonight is going to just basically lay out why atheism is ridiculous, which is kind of weird uh, to think about because I feel like it's a fairly reasonable position. I feel like a lot of religious claims border on the magical or at least the supernatural kind of. So it's a little weird to have a religious person say that atheism is worse than magic when magic is their standard. It's it's a little odd to me. But anyways, tonight we're going to figure out uh, why atheism is worse than magic or some shit. <laughs> We have uh, this random person on YouTube who says that atheism is magical. Yeah, do you do you believe that, honey? It's worse than magic. I don't know. But like, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we had some atheist wizards? They just like combine different shit and beakers. So, so there are atheists that cosplay as wizards, and then there are chemists and other scientists that are also atheists. There's nerdy Gandalfs. I don't know if y'all know about the nerdy Gandalfs, but they will steal your data and your card information randomly. The nerdy Gandalfs are a real problem. Problem, I'm telling you. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing, literally nothing, an infinitesimal nugget of space. And then something happened, triggering the most colossal explosion in history. So this is a little bit of a simplified thing, and it's also pretty old because we made some new advancements uh, into our hypotheses about the inflation of the universe. For one thing, it was not an explosion. It was an inflation event. And this inflation event was most likely caused, at least this is the leading explanation right now, is by a quantum scalar field that was in a false vacuum state, and that fluctuated from the false vacuum state into a true vacuum state. When this occurs, an immense amount of energy is released. When this energy is released from this quantum quantum scalar field, it inflated the universe nearly, nearly instantaneously, and it filled it with all this energy. This energy then uh, transformed from the state that it was in into what would eventually become matter. It took about like, 300,000 years for the uh, universe to cool down enough for, you know, light to travel through the universe, but also for atoms to start to form and for other things to start to form. It was saying, for one thing, saying that it, absolutely nothing, like literally nothing is a misrepresentation as well because it's not literally nothing. It's a more scientific understanding of nothing. And this uh, scientific understanding of nothing would include something because when you remove out of section of space, if you remove everything, all radiation, uh, just everything out of it, you still have an electrical charge that exists within there. So it's not literally nothing. There is still something there even though you've removed everything from it. You start off from a bad position here in taking a very dumbed down version of an old idea of the inflation of the universe. And he thinks that that is the current leading hypothesis. So he's off to a very bad start to begin with. If, if you're religious and you're watching this and you want to make some kind of video debunking like uh, the Big Bang theory or the inflation of the universe, or you want for some reason to put a, a giant space wizard out there that spoke an incantation and created everything uh, by it doesn't matter. What you need to do, first off, is get with the current leading hypothesis on what happened at the beginning of the universe, right? That's what you need to do. So, yeah, that's uh, that's basically what, what um, a, a lot of apologists think right there. Smoke weed every day. From nothing, nothing comes. To allege the universe came from nothing is to believe zero plus zero can equal one. This is a, a, a misrepresentation because we're not saying zero plus zero equals one, but uh, as far as mathematics goes, depending on how you're rounding your numbers here, you can definitely have something that looks like zero and something that looks like zero be added together and you'll get one. It depends on how you're rounding these numbers. You, he's talking about pure integers, so I'm guessing he's talking talking about like 0.00. So, I mean, if you were to go to that, this is a straw man understanding. 
because what we're actually saying is that it's zero point whatever in the fuck plus the complementary zero plus whatever in the fuck and that's going to equal one so it actually makes total sense because of the energy that's left in empty space it's not literally zero so this is a misrepresentation that nothing plus nothing can equal something i like how dirty smudge plus dirty smudge equals five what the fuck is that supposed to mean like this just doesn't even make sense as a mathematical see this is how you know somebody doesn't understand math or anything of that nature because this just literally makes no sense i don't know how they're comparing this to science or the inflation of the universe it just it it just literally makes no no goddamn sense this is against the natural law of mathematics and is thus a supernatural assertion basically they're trying to apply the laws of nature as they exist now to a time prior to the laws of nature governing governing this universe so the laws of nature of, of space time and all that came into existence when uh, the universe inflated but He's talking about trying to make this universe adhere to these laws of physics before those laws of physics were applicable. And what we have found, uh, the closer that we get back to the inflation of the universe, we found that the laws of physics actually break down. Similar situations happen as you get closer to the event horizon of a black hole. So given this idea, it makes no sense to constrain the inflation of the universe to the current laws when the current laws they wouldn't be applicable at that point in time. There wasn't time, I guess. I mean, there wasn't time at that point, but at that particular point in reality's, I guess, history, they would not have been active, these laws of nature. So it just makes no sense. To demonstrate, take some nothing in your right hand and some in your left. Combine them and you'll discover zero plus zero equals zero. Uh, again, what I have in my hand is not nothing. We're all moving through a fluid right now. If we weren't moving through a fluid and there was just literally nothing around me, I would be dead. Okay, there's a fluid here. I mean, it's it's air and, and air operates just like a fluid. So it, it has pressure and all this other shit that fluids have and it operates like a fluid. Like I, it's not that I have nothing in my hands right now. It's not like I'm grabbing like nature's ball or something and the balls are nothing I guess we're adding air this air to this air and you just uh, have more air like it's just air like I mean nothing's changing but there's also it's not that there's nothing in my hands this is because if nothing exists then the possibility of anything coming into being doesn't exist either citation fucking needed for this one I have no idea how you would justify this particular claim that if nothing exists then the possibility ability of anything coming into existence doesn't exist either how, how would you even determine this like what why um why would you think this I, I i simply don't know how that they would substantiate this at all but if it were possible the universe could come from nothing it becomes inexplicable why other things don't also come from nothing well, this is a little bit of a misunderstanding, uh, one, of the inflation of the universe, and two, how our universe operates now. Uh, so there are virtu uh, virtual particles, which are particles that appear to pop in and out of existence from quote-unquote nothing. Really, they're just particles that are changing energy states really quickly. Uh, they, they appear to pop in and out of existence. Uh, there's nothing that says that, you know, some, uh, some kind of shit can't just pop into existence, but that's not normally how our universe operates. So th this is just a fundamental misunderstanding of how our universe operates. Also, quantum scalar fields producing a, an immense amount of energy when they fluctuate is something that can happen. Th th this is why it's important to understand the leading hypothesis before making a video like this. <laughs> yes, honey, their choice of colors right now is pretty bad. There can't be anything about nothing that favors universes because nothing doesn't have any properties nor can it be constrained because there's nothing to be constrained. 
But you see, that's just not true. What he's talking about is a theoretical nothing where absolutely nothing exists. But the scientific version of nothing, the practical version of nothing that actually exists is uh, it does have something in it and uh, can be constrained and is constrained. We know at least that it's it's constrained on a quantum level, that there are quantum things that govern the you know reality in general. All of this right here is just because he doesn't understand the leading hypothesis and quantum mechanics and all this other stuff, which I don't expect people to be an expert in. Hell, I'm not an expert in quantum fucking mechanics, but at least I can understand the leading hypothesis. About that. Of course it's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. That's why it's interesting. doesn't say anything right here, so I'm just going to have Brocif uh, do my Brocephus voice. Although crude and not a true Brocephus, but anyways. It's irrational to use a supernatural explanation to support a natural proposition. At least with magic, you have the magician and the hat from which the rabbit comes. Exactly what, what's meant by, by nothing, but whatever it is, it's very, very simple. And why is that funny? <laughs> well, I think it's a bit funny to be trying to define nothing. <laughs> it's a bit funny that uh, this cardinal guy right here, it's uh, I forget what his name is, but he definitely got arrested for child porn shit. George Pell. Yes, Cardinal George Pell. Let's just do a little bit of Google flu right here because I don't have all the pedophiles memorized. Uh, let's see. George Pell allegations of sexual abuse 2002 allega allegation in June 2002, a, a Melbourne man accused Pell of sexually abusing him at a Catholic youth camp in 1961 when the accuser was 12 years old. Honestly, uh, this doesn't really matter to the conversation that's being had. If, if there's a pedophile laughing at me, I just I just don't care. They're laughing at, at Dawkins here, which I loathe Dawkins. They're laughing at him because Dawkins is talking about this nothing that exists. I, I feel like it's the mark of an uneducated mind uh, when instead of listening to somebody try to educate you on their position in this way and then you start laughing at them for for that. Generally, you know, I'll, I'll laugh at somebody's position, but after they've kind of explained it, but they don't even give them, give them this. I wasn't trying to poison the well to suggest that, oh, this guy's a pedophile, therefore everything he says is wrong. That's not what I was trying to say. I was just trying to point out here that, like, he is laughing at Dawkins, but it's kind of like, ah, you know, you're a pet. I don't like Dawkins either. I don't think either of them should be laughing at each and uh, or each other. <laughs> Nothing is a term of universal negation. It means not anything. Well, I mean, there are several different definitions of nothing in which you could use here. But when we're talking about the beginning of the universe and the inflation of the universe, we're talking about a very specific definition of nothing. We're talking about this very real version of nothing, the scientific version of nothing, not this hypothetical version of nothing where absolutely nothing exists. But like saying that there's nothing in my hand is a true statement, but that doesn't mean that absolutely nothing is in my hand. This is just a, a mix up in, in terms here. If I told you I ate nothing for lunch today, would you ask me what did it taste like? Well, no, I wouldn't. But if you said I wouldn't ask you that, this seems like a nonsensical question to even ask. Some have instead proposed the universe had no beginning but is infinite and always existed. This is kind of an old idea, and it has been dispelled that the universe is, uh, you know, infinite. I would say that it's reality that has been infinite in some kind of way, because there's a uh, very obviously, like, sort of foundation of reality that extends outside of our universe. I think that that plausibly could be infinite. The universe is infinite, it has been dis dispelled since we discovered that the universe inflated. But the concept of anything infinite creates further complications. There are two propositions to consider, a potential and an actual infinite. 
Well, luckily, we don't have to worry about either of these things because nobody thinks that the universe is infinite. God, you know, spoke everything into existence through an incantation, uh, you know, in Genesis 1. Uh, see, the thing is, is that when they started laughing at Dawkins for saying nothing or uh, trying to explain nothing or describe nothing, well, when they, when they were laughing at him, they were laughing at him from a position as like, this guy doesn't have a wizard to say magic words to create everything. He's trying to describe nothing. Nothing? It seems weird. A potential infinite is something growing to infinity, but never gets there as you can always add one more. In contrast, an actual infinite is a completed infinite. The fuck does that mean? I mean, seriously, like what the fuck is an actual infinite? Like infinity is a concept in mathematics. It is not something that can be actualized. It, there is no maximum integer or maximum real number or anything like that. That doesn't exist. So I have no idea what actual infinity is in this respect, because this is not a mathematical concept. It is actually infinite. It's already complete. If the past never had a beginning, then there's been an actually infinite number of moments prior to today. But that's impossible. Nothing infinite can exist within time, because time progresses. So there'll always be another moment, and thus, never reach infinity. But that's the point of infinity. Nothing ever reaches infinity. That's why we have limits in calculus. <laughs> you always figure out what the value of some function is as it approaches infinity, not when it's like literally at infinity. You, you uh, because infinity, like I said, is a concept, not a real number. This entire section here is just devoid of any mathematical understanding. But more to the point, we know that there's not an infinite past to our current universe because we've been able to capture pictures of the inflation of the universe, well, the, the light, the radiation left over after the inflation of the universe. We've been able to capture that in the microwave background radiation. We know that our universe had a beginning, as far as we can tell. Talking about infinities and, and the universe existing for infinity, uh, I mean, it, it seems like a moot point. As far as, like, distance goes in general, you can whittle down distance to, like, an, an infinitesimal amount of spa of spots in between two points. Like, I mean, that that that's a literal thing. That's why we have limits. Like as this approaches infinity, what does it look like? And I mean, that's essentially calculus. To illustrate, here's today. Here's yesterday. The day before yesterday and last week. This line cannot extend infinitely into the past. Why is that not a possibility? Is there some kind of like cap on the number line? Is there a max real number that exists and just nobody knows about it? Um, infinite being a concept, meaning just a very large numbers. I, I, I feel like there's no number, like there's no cap on the amount of numbers that can exist. You're going to need to substantiate this. You're going to need to provide some kind of citation for this. Unless you're like that fuck on Twitter that it's just like, fuck you, I'm not giving you citations. Then there's no point in you putting up this, uh, this, uh, this fucking video here. And get here today because you can't reach the end of an infinite. Because an infinite is something that has no end. I feel like there's a little bit of a contradiction here because he says that, you know, this cannot extend infinitely into the past. If it can't extend infinitely in the past, then it has to stop somewhere, right? But then then they go on to say that you'll never reach infinite or something like that. Like, you, it just keeps adding on and on and on and on and on, right? I feel like there's two competing ideas here that are that makes it a little bit hypocritical. Neither can you add anything to an infinite. But tomorrow, there'll be another day. And a day after that. These anomalies demonstrate the past cannot be infinite, but finite. And therefore, the universe began to exist. You see, I feel like this is a bullshit argument to get to the universe began to exist, okay? Because for one thing, he's not supported any of his claims here with any kind of evidence. Second, we have actual emp empirical information that suggests the universe had a beginning. So you don't need this bullshit argument. And as from nothing comes nothing. The universe couldn't come from nothing, but from something. I'm guessing that something is just a magical wizard that has spoken incantation and created everything out of nothing, I guess, maybe. But again, he would need to support this with citations, and he just doesn't. Like how your unborn child couldn't appear from nothing, 
but comes from something. You know, obviously he's arguing for a very specific kind of God. I don't know what kind. Fucking Jesus popped out of nothing. Like, the, there was no sex for Mary. She was a perpetual virgin by Catholic standards. Uh, so, I mean, Jesus came into existence out of, like, nothing. Ma Mary was just the, the, the vessel that carried the, the baby. But still, how did the baby come to be, uh, you know, gestating inside Mary? Because it definitely wasn't sperm, right? I mean, the Holy Spirit, Spirit filled her. Unless the Holy Spirit is like a Bible code word for sperm, then Jesus appeared out of nothing. I mean, two smudges definitely equals Jesus. You. Nor can the universe create itself, as it would need to exist to create itself before it existed. So he's saying that nature would need to create itself before it existed. Well, that's why, you know, you can delineate between reality and this universe. This universe didn't exist at one point in time. I don't know if any other universes existed before this one, or even if this universe is the first iteration of this universe. We don't know. I, I don't think that the universe needs to create itself first in order for the universe to come into existence. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what they're trying to say with this. Thus, natural and temporal explanations fail, suggesting the possibility beyond the natural to the supernatural. I feel like right here what's needed is uh, Welcome to the Twilight Zone. Things don't come from nothing, so everything that begins to exist must have a cause. Uh, I don't have any kind of qualms with this, but typically apologists will take this a little bit too far and uh, to say that the whole cause thing it, it traces all the way back to an initial cause, which is just an Aquinas thing. And that's ridiculous. Mathwiz says he claimed that the Big Bang was nonsensical because it was supernatural. But now all of a sudden he's fine with supernatural explanations. Yeah, I mean, he's going to go there. He's going to go the supernatural route. But I guess he's saying that you can't shit talk the supernatural and claim only natural things happen and then use like the Big Bang because the Big Bang is apparently supernatural or some shit. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. All right, so this is the very basic Kalong cosmological argument or the argument from first cause that there was some cause at the beginning of the universe that created the universe or the universe came into being. As far as the cosmological or the Kalam cosmological argument goes in this very basic form like he's got up here, I don't have a problem with it because the cause for the universe was just a fluctuation uh, from a false vacuum state into a true vacuum state of this quantum scalar field. That's why the universe inflated. So this right here, here actually works perfectly with the natural explanation. It, it, it cites a cause for the universe to have inflated, so there's no problem. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Do they realize when you talk about quantum mechanics, things like causation doesn't explain anything? For example, have you heard of the Kashmir effect? I, I have heard of that. I, I can't I can't think right off the top of my head what it is, but I know that I've heard of it before. It's just been a while. But saying quantum field theory, the Kashmir effect is a physical force acting on the macroscopic boundaries of a confined space, which arises from the quantum fluctuations in the field. It is named after Dutch physicist Hendrik Kashmir, uh, who predicted the effect of electromagnetic systems in 1948. Y yeah, uh, I mean, I think that's kind of along the lines of what I'm talking about. Y you know, basically that these quantum fluctuations have real effects on, ma on the macro level, right? Ma I don't know if I'm misunderstanding that. But what caused the cause? The question, what caused the cause or where did God come from? I like I like how he's already conflating both the theological questions with the real natural questions. Like, what caused the cause? You could do that with everything, except what theologically, because theologically they say, oh, well, God didn't need to be created. So they specially plead their God away from having to answer this question. As far as what caused the cause, I mean, we, we don't really have a full understanding of quantum mechanics, but, you know, we, we do have a, a somewhat of an understanding of it, at least as far as the information that we have now goes. So, I mean, we, we do understand these things and we don't need to postulate a God. Assumes time is actually infinite and that God is confined in time, at some point in time appearing from nothing. But as time cannot be actually infinite, time began to exist and everything that begins to exist has a cause. 
space and time are uh, coupled together. You know, one affects the other and they came into existence uh, when this universe came into existence. Uh, space time was created at the inflation of the universe. That's why there was no time before the Big Bang. We don't know what it might have looked like or how that might have operated other than on a quantum level, but space time definitely had a beginning. I don't know about like a definite end for space time. We are going to suffer a heat death in this universe at some point as our universe comes into an equilibrium of zero energy. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a like definite end to time or that there's no uh, uh, or that there's some kind of end cap for time. Therefore, time has a cause that's beyond it. I don't know how you would substantiate that. That makes no sense. Like all of this, everything can be can be explained naturally without some kind of magical face Jew up there like doing everything. I mean, I'm not I know it's a little derogatory, but I mean, that's what he's like. That's what he's doing here. He's got like this slit with the Jew and the space lasers in the space. I'm not trying. I mean, if he doesn't want people making fun of his Jesus like that, maybe you should put him in space like that with laser face. <laughs> To illustrate, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, but on what page of Hamlet can you find Shakespeare? As Shakespeare is not inside the book, but beyond it, God is not inside time, but beyond it. This is just a very general special pleading argument here, because he's specially pleading that his God is outside of time, but yet he can also affect things within time. He's just arbitrarily making up properties about God without actually providing any kind of reasons as to why God would have those properties other than God has to be outside of space and time in order for him to create it. Space and time uh, coming into existence naturally is uh, has a lot of benefits. For one, it's natural. That's how we know the, the real world operate naturally. So it's got that on the supernatural space Jew hypothesis. But arbitrarily placing some sentience outside of space and time I feel introduces a lot of problems. Like, how does anything exist outside of space and time? Like, physically exist? Like, how does that even work? I have no idea. Therefore, he did not begin at some point in time, as he's not in time. He's special. He's outside of time. I'm going to arbitrarily place him there because it works out for my bullshit argument. The cause of space, time, and matter cannot be made of space, time, and matter. It existed before it created them. Uh, well, but you see, the quantum, like quantum scalar fields aren't, aren't necessarily matter as we understand them. All the components for matter started, you know, to, or, or was, was created at the inflation. Therefore, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. I'm really fucking tired of Frank Turek's bullshit being regurgitated by people that don't understand the topic that they're talking about. We had that one guy that gave that little short master class where he basically just took notes from Frank Turek and repeated them back to us. Like, we just don't need that shit. We don't need to hear this spaceless, timeless, uh, immaterial shit from anybody else other than Frank Turek, okay? We just don't. Frank's bad enough. Leave that bullshit to Frank Turek. Powerful in order to create the universe, personal to choose to create, and intelligent to have a mind in order to make a choice. You see, as far as the beginning of the universe goes, I don't see a need for a choice to happen. Like, is there a choice that occurs whenever uh, rain happens? Like whenever it rains here, whenever the heat index is 115 and, you know, I'm dripping in sweat in my office, in my house. Like, was there a choice that was made there to like set me ablaze inside my home? And, well, no, I'm. But, <laughs> Casey said, yep, because we don't want to freeze the AC. No, I'm talking about the fact that, you know, uh, Alabama was closer to the sun than it really should be this past week. Was was there a choice made that made, you know, the heat index that much? Uh, you know, regardless of the, you know, the whole um, climate change aspect of it and how we made the choice to burn fossil fuels and everything like that. Just talking about how nature operates. Is there a choice made when it rains? Is there a choice made when water evaporates? Is there a choice made when water freezes? Like as far 
part is like the actual process of water freezing. Do any of these things require a choice? If not, then why does the beginning of the universe require a choice? If the beginning of the universe is natural, like everything else is in, um, you know, our reality, why would there need to be a choice? He says that it's personal and intelligent. What evidence do you have that it's personal and intelligent? Why are these aspects of, you know, whatever created this universe? It's just arbitrary bullshit. That's everything. Everything in this list from Frank Turek is arbitrary bullshit that they have had to assign to God because people have come up with uncomfortable questions for their bullshit. And so they just tack on one arbitrary ad hoc statement after another, you, you know, like, oh, it's got to be spaceless. Oh, well, you know, it's got to be timeless, too. Oh, it's got to be immaterial because fuck what's God made out of uh, unicorn shits and baby doll farts or something like I don't know. Who do you think of? The argument can be summarized as follows. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. 2. The universe began to exist. 3. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Again, the cosmological uh, argument, like the, the basic Kalam cosmological argument, still the natural explanation is far more parsimonious with what we experience in reality than the supernatural space Jew that created everything. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Okay, that's it. That's all of their bullshit video. Wow, so what did you guys think as far as this video goes? It's, again, another regurgitation of Frank Turk. It's a Frank Turk clone who has basically just watched enough of Frank Turk's videos in order to put together a slideshow of Frank Turk's best hits on the Kalam cosmological argument and is just presenting them to us. Uh, nothing about Frank's argument is really so, like uh, substantiated with evidence um, and the things that uh, are reasonable in his argument are better explained by natural explanations. So uh, I've been finding a lot of people that have just tinkered Frank Turek's points and think that they're just correct, that they just make sense without doing any kind of critical thinking about them. They don't have good responses to, um, you know, any challenges as far as explaining these things naturally. Whenever they have something that must mean a God, it's because they have crafted it to mean a God, to point towards their particular God, or I guess a space Jew in this particular instance. Everything in this video has already been dealt with. This is an old argument, but people are still trading it as new and people are still being convinced by Frank Turk and his stupid shit. So I will continue to point out the flaws uh, in these types of arguments because people are still being convinced by them. But in any case, I'd love to hear what you guys think. If you will, please go down below in the comments or in the live stream. Let me know what you think about this guy's video here. Uh, well, really, it's what do you think about Frank Turk? You know, that's what I'm really asking here. Uh, if you're leaving out right now, I hope you have a great weekend, a great next week and everything like that. Um, don't forget to stand up and use your voice.